thanks, Catherine. It's great to be here. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you all for being here as well. So Catherine asked me to, to speak about you know, this genetic market capture project. This marked the 16th year of this year that we put the data in Georgia. Before I get there, though, I wanted to acknowledge the really rich legacy that we have with sea turtle conservation here in Georgia. Florida can claim most of the turtles, but we've had a really strong legacy here, here in Georgia. So I'm going to sprinkle some history throughout. Um, some of you, most of you are probably sea turtle folks, some of you may not be, so I've tried to put some sea turtle life history in here as well, so that I'm not coming completely out of left field, but again, feel free to stop me at any point if something doesn't make sense. I know genetics doesn't come naturally to a lot of folks, <laughs> I promise. This is very methods light, but if you do have questions that pop up as I go along, I'm happy to stop and answer those. So loggerheads are one of seven species of, of sea turtles that we have globally. These are lineages that have been around for millions of years. And all of them are of conservation concern, mainly because of us, humans, activities that have either directly or indirectly have impacted sea turtles. So these are the nine major loggerhead nesting aggregations around the world. We're really fortunate here in the southeastern U.S. to host the largest of all of those. So we have the healthiest loggerhead nesting aggregation anywhere in the world, which means our population is really important for the species overall. And this looks like a really fairly straightforward life history but this really represents the culmination of decades of research by dozens of scientists around the world. This is some great artwork on Don Witherington, and it highlights just how complicated these sea turtle life histories can be. So the nesting females are the most accessible life stage. They have to come ashore and lay those eggs in dry sand for them to be able to breathe. But then when we see those little hatchlings crawl down to the water and disappear, it was really a black box for a very long time about where they were going and what they were up to. And so genetics have helped play an important role in filling out this, this life cycle that we now understand for loggerhead turtles. But before I get there, I wanted to start with some of the, some of the folks who have made a, a huge difference in sea turtle conservation. Carol Ruckteschel started surveying the beach on Cumberland because she recognized the importance of systematic surveys in documenting a lot of these turtles that were washing up stranded. And those surveys ultimately became what is now NOAA's Sea Turtle Stranding and Salvage Network, which is a national program. Not too long after that, Sally Murphy, who is from Savannah, she was the South Carolina DNR Sea Turtle Coordinator for many years. She also was documenting these huge numbers of strandings on the nesting beaches. And these were big nesting females with large juveniles. So these were the most important members of the population. These are the ones that had survived those 25, 30, 35 years to reach sexual maturity. And unfortunately, they were being taken out of the nesting population by these bottom trawl fisheries. And so they recognized very early on that this was a really big problem. And Fortunately, once again, a Georgian came to the rescue. Sinky Boone from Darien invented the Georgia Jumper and worked really closely with Georgia DNR and NOAA to modify what has become these turtle excluder devices or TEDs that are now required in a lot of these trawl fisheries globally. And they brought folks here to the U.S. Sinky actually traveled to Mexico and Costa Rica to train fishers in those countries as well. So I shared an office with one of his sons, Sean, who was a veterinarian, he came back for grad school. And it just dawned on me that, you know, we often think of the fishers as bad guys, but I'm like, your dad has saved literally, you know, tens of thousands of sea turtles around the world. And it really shows how important it is to try to work together to solve some of these problems rather than just demonizing folks. Now I think a lot of our attention has turned to the oceanic life stage. So this is the first part of the life cycle for these loggerheads. They're probably spending the first 10 to 12 years of their lives in this particular stage where they vanish from our coasts. And for a very long time, we didn't know where they were. You can imagine there's, these basically are oases in the desert. 
in terms of all the life that's concentrated in these, these weed vines of, of sargassum and brown algae. Unfortunately, this is also where we have a lot of longline fisheries, and so a lot of these little turtles are caught on the hooks that are baited to catch a lot of species with things like squid. So they're baiting the hooks with what should be turtle food, so not surprisingly, the turtles are attracted to that. And really another huge emerging issue is all of the processes that are pushing these sargassum weed lines together are also pushing anything else that's floating in the water into these habitats. So when we had the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, all that, all that oil was ended up in these habitats. And really the huge threat that we're also concerned with now are the microplastics that a lot of these little turtles are ingesting. Mm -hmm. So this is getting a lot more attention now. It's, it's getting a lot of attention because we are also ingesting a lot of this. We are swallowing a lot of this and what we're eating and drinking and even possibly what we're inhaling. Just it's literally so pervasive that it's in the air that we breathe. So we don't really know what kind of impact these are going to have on the populations, but you can imagine that's not doing this turtle any good to have all of that. Uh, even the turtles that are washed back that, that seem to pass it okay, obviously that's not giving them nutrition that their food would be. So Dr. Archie Garr was considered by many to be sort of the father of modern sea turtle biology. He was born in Mobile, but he actually spent some time in his childhood in Savannah, so we can claim a little bit of a, a Georgia connection there, even though he ended up at the University of Florida. One of the last talks he gave before he died, he highlighted three what he considered holy grail questions that we needed to answer to effectively conserve sea turtles. And you see them there. Number one was, are these females coming home when they come to a nesting beach to lay their eggs? The second was, how are sea turtles navigating? And the third was, those little lost year turtles, those little oceanic juveniles, where are they going and what are they doing while they're there? And genetics have really helped resolve, especially question one and three. You can imagine there's a lot of different ways you can try to answer that question one, and Carl Olympus in Australia, George Hughes in South Africa did it by marking hatchlings. These are not good master's projects. Um, <laughs> you're marking hundreds of thousands of hatchlings, and you're waiting that 25, 30, 35 years. <laughs> so you better hope you stick with sea turtles for your career. Paul, Paul did, and so 30 years later, he saw some of those hatchlings that he had marked come back to the nesting beach. Mm. Wow. But um, there are easier ways to get some of these answers, and one of the people that figured this out was, was Brian Bowen, who was a PhD student in the genetics department at the University of Georgia. So again, another Georgia contribution. Ryan Bowen really led the way in testing genetics in all the sea turtle species, and he ultimately was able to confirm that yes, when these females are coming to a nesting beach, this is home to them. They're coming back to the area where they hatch to lay their eggs. And so, once you have those baseline data from the nesting populations, then you can start applying these turtles in the water to try to figure out you know, where did they come from. So this is some of his early work. The different colors that you see in the pie charts there are different types of mitochondrial DNA. So this is the type of DNA that's passed down from the mother to her offspring. And in this case, what he was able to demonstrate was that these little oceanic juveniles that are caught in the middle there around Hawaii by the longline fleet, and these large teenage turtles that were foraging off the coast of Mexico were actually hatching in Japan. So these were little Japanese hatchlings that were swimming out to the Crocio current, and they were making that full circuit around the North Pacific gyre during their development. And we've seen this pattern now around the globe. So it's really tricky to figure these sorts of things out, especially with those little hatchlings and oceanic juveniles. There's been a lot of progress towards solar tags that have been miniaturized to the point they can be put on these really small juveniles. I don't think we're quite small enough yet to actually put them on hatchlings. Mm -hmm. So you get little glimpses into what they're up to, but we haven't been able to follow them from the beach out. And so one of the ways we traditionally try to figure out what this dispersal footprint looks like is through 
this modeling process. So what you're seeing up there is what we think the dispersal footprint looks like as those little hatchlings leave each of these nine major nesting areas. The problem is this is under the assumption of passive drift. And a lot of work has gone into documenting what behavior does to contribute to these turtles moving around. And so Nathan Putman and Kate Mansfield have demonstrated these turtles aren't passively drifting. They're actively swimming. And a little bit of active swimming goes a long way to affect the trajectory of these turtles. So with colleagues from Brazil and, and part of this Atlantic Loggerhead Genetics Working Group for part of my postdoc in California, we revisited this question for some of these little oceanic juveniles here in the South Atlantic. It turned out most of them were local. They were coming from the Brazilian nesting populations. But when we went back and resequenced some of Brian Bowman's original samples, we found connections as far away as Western Australia. So this really does demonstrate how truly international a lot of the, these processes are. Shows how complicated this gets. Having the, the answers from the genetics doesn't fix the problem, but it at least identifies who are the right stakeholders to bring to the table to try to, to make policy changes. And then when we zoom in locally here in the Northwest Atlantic, picture gets even muddier. So we have these two really common female families, the A1s in blue and the A2s in yellow. But note how those pie charts change as you move from north to south. These are not one big melting pot. These females, we think, within a region, if they're hatching in central Florida, they're returning to central Florida when they reach sexual maturity. So, you look on the Atlantic coast of Florida there, uh, that's Cape Canaveral and Melbourne <coughs> Beach, which is Archie Carr National Wildlife Refuge, a really important nesting habitat for loggerheads. If you move just a little bit further south, we have Juneau Beach and Fort Lauderdale there. So you see how similar those two are to one another within a region, but how different those two regions are. So our interpretation is that on a scale of roughly 100 kilometers, we're dealing with completely separate nesting populations when it comes to the females that are there. And so this has turned out to be really important. This is some of my dissertation work that Fish and Wildlife Service used to designate critical nesting habitat. So rather than just focusing on the really large nesting populations, they broke it out by genetic subpopulation to make sure some of these smaller populations were also protected. I feel like I'm moving kind of quickly, so does anybody have any questions so far? So this brings us to, well, first of all, I should, I should elaborate further here. So one of the subpopulations that we've identified are what we call the Northern Recovery Unit. So that's all those turtles, technically north of Florida, although our work has shown that, that this subpopulation kind of also exists, especially on Amelia, and probably a little further south in north, northeastern Florida. Note what we see on, on all these, this is also all island here in Cape Romaine, in South Carolina. All the females look identical with this marker. So we can't use this mitochondrial DNA to tell us anything about the scale of female homing once we get north of Florida, even though we have loggerheads nesting all the way up through Virginia. So we need a different approach to try to figure out what is home to these females. And that brings us to how we monitor sea turtle populations around the world. Most of the species are nocturnal, and so we're not actually going out and looking at turtles most often. We're going out on the beach and we're counting nests the morning after. So a lot of data around the world are going out there counting those nests. And as Catherine alluded to earlier, things were looking pretty scary in the mid 2000s. So for us in Georgia, 2004, things kind of bottomed out. In Florida, it was 2007 that ended up being a low year. The, the downside of tracking these females in the population through the nest counts is we have no way to forecast what's coming. All we can kind of tell is what's happening on the ground right now. So we really didn't know what to expect after that 2004 nesting season. These are Florida data from their index nesting beach program. This is most of the turtles in the southeastern nesting in Florida, probably about 90% of them. And you see that things were looking really promising through the 90s, and then once we hit toward the end of the 90s, things were going the wrong direction. So a lot of the question at this point was, 
what do these declining nest counts actually mean? Do we really have fewer females nesting, or is there something going on out there where they're not getting enough to eat, they're not getting enough good quality food, and they're just not able to lay as many sets of eggs as often? And so to answer those sorts of questions, you can't just rely on these nests. You actually need individual female nesting histories. And this is where we also have a really nice legacy in Georgia. So Jim Richardson at UGA and his wife Thelma were instrumental in starting what has now become the Georgia Sea Turtle Cooperative that Georgia DNR manages. They started tagging on Little Hummerlin in the, in the early 60s and so had one of the longest running clipper tagging projects in the world for, for decades. And Jim was also in on the ground floor with uh, a lot of the Florida folks, with Sally Murphy, and starting this annual workshop for sea turtle biology and conservation, which we now know as the International Sea Turtle Society. And Georgia hosted about half of the first 15 meetings that were held going back to the early 1980s. So this is another place where everything that we know now we're building on this really rich history of a lot of folks who put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into these, these studies. The challenge with intercepting these females at night is they're capable of coming in, nesting, covering, and being gone within an hour if they come out at high tide. So the challenge is you're trying to cover the beach every hour, all night. And so that's obviously logistically tough on a lot of our beaches where we have these, these bone yards. It makes it hard to get to all the available nesting habitat through the tidal cycles. And there's also was some pushback in terms of permitting. So there was this tagging reflex, you know, why are you out there, what's the question? So we're basically down at this point to four tagging beaches for this northern recovery unit. So we have a thousand kilometers of nesting beach and we have four programs that are out at night looking at these turtles. So we're lucky that two of those are in Georgia, Credit Research Project out on Wausau and the Georgia Sea Turtle Center on Jekyll. The challenge is this is about 5% of the habitat for our subpopulation. And so we know a lot of these females are moving around. There's a lot of really important, valuable data that come from being able to put hands on these turtles, to be able to see the turtles. But we also know that we're missing information because those turtles are nesting on other islands. So we really needed a way to track these females that wasn't so logistically challenging. And we found it completely by accident. So we were working with Little Cumberland and Jocelyn Coulter was one of the technicians out there. They had a raccoon depredated nest. So she found a bunch of eggshells on the beach and had the foresight to freeze some of those eggshells and ask, hey, can you tell if this is one of our tagged females? And I told her not to hold her breath because there's nothing in the literature that, that made me think we could make it work. But we played with it for about a month and it did work. And it was one of their tagged females. So the light bulb went off about what we could do with this sort of approach, and we started with a pilot study on a few of the islands in Georgia in 2006, and it just sort of blew up from there. Hey, Brian. Yes. Just to clarify, did you already have tissue from those tag females? Yes. Yeah, so Little Cumberland was taking a small skin sample from each of the females that they were they were tagging, and we were able to match the DNA from the eggshell to the DNA from the skin sample. So I know a lot of the folks that are out surveying, it depends on where you are. You know, if you're on little St. Simons, you're on a bicycle. If you're on Cumberland, you get to drive in a truck. It's kind of nice. Um, sometimes you may have air conditioning, sometimes not. But the normal protocol north of Florida is if you call it a nest, you have to dig down and verify that there are eggs there. And that's what I'm doing here on St. Catherine's Island. And so if there's not already an egg broken, we take one egg from each nest. We save the eggshell, bring it into the lab. The army of undergraduates um, chops the eggshell and folds it into what you see there. And then after soaking in a water bath overnight with some different chemicals, we're able to pull the DNA out of that sample. So that's what um, Aaliyah is doing here at the vacuum manifold. And I can't, again, state how important it's been to have a really great crew of undergraduate students over the years. 
going back to the beginning of the project, we work with over 50 students now that have contributed to this. This is part of the crew from the summer and my interim lab manager, Kayla, there in the center that kind of kept all the parts moving and everything working. This is what the raw data from one female looks like. And the cool thing about this, these are markers that I, that I cherry picked for part of my thesis work. These are exactly the same kind of markers that we use in human forensics. So if the police take a sample, they're gonna use the same type of markers that we're using here to identify individuals. I can show you a little better of what this process looks like. So this is one piece of the information that we gather. These are two different Florida nests. And if you look here at marker 28, we have one shared allele, and allele is just a different variant at this particular marker, but then the other one's different. So these two don't match. We know these aren't the same turbo. If we look at marker 73 in green, both of the peaks that are there fall in the same spot. So this is a match. Basically all we're looking at here is length variation in pieces of DNA that we're copying, and it's due to the different numbers of repeat units that are present in that particular piece of DNA. So the reason I threw these in here as an, as an example is beyond just identifying the individuals, this also gives us information about how they're related. So the reason that I have these two in here is that they share 10, they share data at 10 markers, perfect matches of the 16 that we use, which tells us these two turtles are sisters. They share the same mother, they share the same father. So this is where I get to thank the monitoring networks in all the states. We absolutely could not do a project like this without having really fantastic support from all the state agencies and from what in many cases are community scientists. A lot of these are volunteers, that are collecting these samples, that are running these programs. We have over 80 projects that we work with. So at this point, everybody that's on the beach in the morning is collecting samples for this project. And that's really made it powerful for us to have that kind of coverage. So we started statewide sampling in Georgia in 2008. We picked up the northern states starting in 2010. And then ultimately, we were able to get permission to dip our toes back into, into Florida. We have folks in Nassau, Duval, and St. John's County. So we go down to basically marine land in Florida, starting in 2016. And so going back to the beginning of the project now, we've identified the mothers of over 117,000 nests now, which turns out is over 14,000 unique females. And to get to one of those questions that we had very early on with those sinking nest numbers, the, the data that you see here in blue are nest counts from Georgia DNR going back to when surveys were standardized in the late 1980s. See a nice upward trend there on the back end of this graph. And then the red line underneath represents the number of nesting females that we've identified via the genetic. And so it turns out there really is a nice correlation between the number of nests and the number of nesting females. So if we go backwards in time to 2004, it really does look like that was a bottleneck for the population. And we did indeed have fewer females nesting at that point. Uh, a question, um, the fact that you've got uh, the nesting females going up kind of gradually, but the number of nests going up quite a bit, is that um, due to the education of um, yeah, people about uh, lighting at night and making clearing obstacles on the beach so that they, we don't have failed crawls? I think it's the cumulative effect of all the, the conservation and education work that has gone on. We started protecting a lot of nests going back to the, you know, the 80s. So we're putting more hatchlings in the water. And then with those turtle excluder devices where they were getting pulled out, now they're making it through and they're able to reach sexual maturity. So I don't know that you can credit any one thing. I think it was the combination of everything, all the hard work that everybody had put in over the years. So this is great, it's great news. It's good to know that we have this as a tool. It's good to see that the, this, this population is headed in the right direction in terms of recovery. But we still have a lot of questions that we know we need this individual female data for. And 
And so I, I just want to hit some of the highlights that we have found over the last 16 years and where I think we still have a lot of questions that we need to try to address. The other thing that we were interested in is how many sets of eggs are these females laying in a given year? So we call that clutch frequency. And what you see up there on the left-hand side are counts. On the bottom are the number of nests per female. So these are data from Wausau Island in 2010. And these are just the females based on the tagging, the flipper tags. So these are turtles that people are seeing and laying eyes on. This is a really common distribution for all the sea turtle species around the world. Most of the females that you tag, you tag them and you never see them again. So unfortunately that leaves a lot of questions. Are they next door? Are they dead? Are they still in the breeding population? And this is where the power of having these regional data comes in. So if we look at the regional genetic data, this is what the clutch frequency looks like. And we can account for the turtles that are moving to other beaches. So in, on Wausau in 2010, 64% of the females that nested on that island that year also nested elsewhere. And so that's the challenge of trying to collect these sorts of data from the perspective of any single beach. You're getting part of the picture. And the reason is that some of the turtles move around. Like this female started out on Hilton Head, she dropped down to Wausau, she dropped down to Ossabaugh, she dropped down to St. Catharines, and then she went back up to Hilton Head. It turns out most of the females have fairly strong fidelity, at least considering they have over a thousand kilometers they could be nesting on. So what we found early on is 73% uh, of the females were using 20 kilometers or less beach. So that typically translates to just two or three adjacent barrier islands. But the mileage varies depending on females. There's a lot of individual variation. So this is Mama Pritchard, very famous South Carolina turtle. We have Shane Boylan there in the middle that we have stolen from uh, South Carolina Aquarium. We're now working at the Georgia Sea Turtle Center. Uh, back in 2010 when this turtle was in rehab, he took a blood sample for me from this female. And we were able to... No comment. I can't say anything. He took a blood sample for me and we were able to enter her in the genetics database. So when she returned in 2013, we've been able to track her now over the course of 29 nests, six nesting seasons. And you see those 29 nests are packed into a really small piece of Pritchard's Island. She really likes that spot. On the flip side, we have documented a behavior that we knew about. We had a few turtles where we had physical tag returns, but a lot of people, I think, dismissed this behavior as being really rare. And the first time that it was documented was a turtle that nested at Cape Lookout in North Carolina, and then she ended up down in Cape Canaveral where Doc Earhart found her nesting a few weeks later. This particular female started out nesting near St. Augustine in mid-June. 21 days later, she's nesting up at Cape Lookout in North Carolina. 22 days later, she's back at Jack's Beach. I understand not putting all your eggs in one basket. <laughs> but this seems a little bit extreme. And we've now documented this, this type of behavior, maybe not all three of these nests, but we've documented 66 females that have nested in both Florida and in North Carolina. So when I started my, my thesis work, we always thought that those northern nesting populations were the youngest because they would have been colonized last because as those glaciers retreated, it's finally warming up enough up there to support incubation of these eggs. What I didn't expect is that we would actually look like we're documenting colonization in real time. A lot of the females that are nesting in central and northern North Carolina look like Florida turtles. So it's really interesting to see them jump over Georgia and South Carolina. It's, uh, it's a good thing for the population. It's an insurance policy, right? With global climate change with very dynamic beaches. Having some females that like to move around like this is, is good for making sure they can establish new nesting populations. So the other interesting thing that we've learned, and it took us a long time to get here, so when we first started the project, every turtle that we're sampling pretty much is new to us. 
But that didn't necessarily mean that she was new to the population. She might have been nesting for 10 or 20 years, we don't know. But now that we have been laying this groundwork in Georgia since 2008, we felt like in 2016, if a female showed up for the first time, that meant that she truly was new to the population. She was just beginning to nest. The cool thing about it is in some cases we're able to match those turtles to known mothers also in the database. So this is a special case that shows the power of combining the genetic data with those flipper tag data. So this is a turtle that the Coretta Research Project tagged in 1988. She has three daughters that have entered the nesting population now. And the cool thing about all three of these daughters is they, they demonstrate a behavior that we're finding really common among these new females. So beside each turtle, the number there is the year that she, she started nesting, and the number beside that is how far apart she's spreading her nests. So how far north and south are those nests spread out? So if we look at the turtle in red there, in 2016, she nested as far south as Cumberland and as far north as Blackbeard. So she's spreading those nests out over 72 kilometers of nesting beach. When she returned in 2019, that was only 13 kilometers on Little St. Simons and Sea Island. And when she returned in 2019, it was only two kilometers on Little St. Simons. So a lot of the individual variation that we're seeing seems to be related to previous nesting experience. We really think that for a lot of these females, if you think about it, it's the first time they've set flipper on sand in 25 or 30 years. So they are recalibrating that internal GPS unit during that first nesting year. And you can see it's almost like flipping a switch. Like the very first time they come back after that, they have a much better sense of where it's home at that point. And they really narrow down where they want to be. So if we look at all the new turtles that we've been able to document from 2016 to 2021, that's 5,000 new females that we think entered the nesting population, so that's, that's great news. 1,300 of those nest in Georgia. And again, a lot of these we're able to actually assign to mothers that are in the database. And so of those 5,000, 1,300 we could match to a mom. That really gives us a lot of power when we can connect through space and time, the generations, and start to ask and answer a lot more questions. 345 of those nest in Georgia. So we can start to get at that idea of what is home for these females. How close to where their mothers are nesting are these new females nesting. A little bit complicated here. So what you're looking at is moms on the left, daughters on the right, we know that loggerheads are using the Earth's magnetic field to navigate, and the magnetic isoclines that hit our coastline are perpendicular to the coast. So we can use lines of latitude as a good proxy for this. So what you're looking at is where we've assigned moms to bins over there on the left-hand side where you see the numbers. And basically this is bin two, so it's covering the middle part of the Georgia coast. The arrows are showing us where their, their daughters are nesting. And so the thicker arrows means more daughters. So the majority of these daughters that we think are hatching in any one area are coming back to that area to nest. But you also see a lot of movement, right? So this middle part of the Georgia coast is also sending a lot of turtles down, down here to Jekyll and Little Cumberland and Cumberland, sending a lot of turtles further north too, onto Blackbeard, Sapelos, and Catherine. The average distance right now between where these daughters are nesting and where their moms have last nested is about 100 kilometers. So you often hear, you know, they're, they're going back to the beach where they hatch to lay their eggs. That might be true some of the time, but for our loggerheads, it's more like they're going back to a region that may be a few islands wide, not necessarily a specific beach. The other little tidbit that I wanted to throw out, and I'll probably circle back to this at the end, is for a lot of the turtles, we couldn't assign them to a mom, and that makes a lot of sense. That means mom probably stopped nesting before we started the genetics project. But 20% of those new females, which is you know one in five, had at least one full sister also in the data. And you often hear you know one in 500, one in a thousand, one in 3,000, one in 5,000 reach sexual maturity, and that may be true. 
But if you think about how many clutches of eggs these females are laying, we'll give them a lot of credit, say six on average, 115 eggs per nest. Not all of those are female probably, there's some males sprinkled in there. And we have multiple paternity. So we have multiple males mating with the same female. So you end up with a fairly small pool of, of full sister hatchlings that are hitting the water, and yet we're finding 20% of those have at least pairs of sisters that are making it back. So I don't know what the math should look like, but I don't think that's random. I think there's something really special happening that we try to, need to try to get to the bottom of. Brian, let me ask you a question. Yes. You said that um, when they come back to nest, they come to a region and not to their natal beach. How do you explain, like on Amelia, when we have all six nests are laid on Amelia, they're not laid anywhere else. When she nests six times, that's the most we've found on Amelia at one time. They don't go anywhere else. And that we have a large number of those turtles that nest strictly on Amelia, they don't go anywhere else. Is that a, do you think a particular life stage before they start branching out and going to other parts of the region? I think it's the other way around. I think what we're capturing in a lot of these females, we're catching them on the tail end of their reproductive life. So we missed out on all that movement that happened early. We're catching them where they already know where home is and they know where they want to be. So there's a lot of noise in there that I think we need to account for. One of the questions is, as they they do settle down, are they moving closer to where mom last nested? And then you bring up a good point, since we're catching a lot of these moms at the end of their lives, they may well have nested over much larger areas when they started. Mm -hmm. So it could still be very strong natal homing, it's just that that's not where mom's nesting now. It's where mom may have nested 30 years ago when she first started nesting herself. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I had to throw this in here. It's, this is a very Georgia-focused talk, but the, <laughs> yeah. the largest, the most dense nesting for this subpopulation actually happens up in South Carolina. It's Cape Romaine National Wildlife Refuge. So 25% of all the nests north of Florida, so us all the way up to Virginia, are on two islands in South Carolina, Cape, Cape Island and Lighthouse Island. And you can see that really thick orange arrow there. That's 297 new females nesting in that region that we think probably hatch right there. And turtles that we could assign to a known mother, 40% of those look like they have moms nesting in Cape Romaine. The reason we're concerned about that is these are also two of the most erosional islands in the state of South Carolina. <laughs> So these are photos that Michelle Pate took, the South Carolina DNR coordinator after Adelia. After the storm, both of these islands were completely overwashed. So fortunately, most of the nests had hatched, but of the 400 or so that were left, they were all drowned. You can see that there's not even marsh behind these islands. It's just literally muddy bay. And so the turtles are struggling to find enough dry sand, and they're having to relocate a lot of these nests. These turtles have the strongest sense of home of any on our coast and so they know where they want to be this is where they want to be and they don't care that they're running out of, of sand and i think this is kind of scary for us as potential look into our future you know with climate change with sea level rise increased frequency of these like king tide events and these really strong storm events that we see this could be a glimpse into what you know we might be seeing everywhere and so it raises a lot of questions about how we manage for this over time, I don't have any answers. I just think we need to probably start figuring it out. So we have enough data long enough turn now to know this is where these turtles want to be, and they don't care that they're, you know, there's not really a lot of dry sand left there anymore. So some other threats that are emerging that I wanted to mention, a lot of you probably have heard about this. Um, Two of the lead authors on this paper actually were, were colleagues in California while I was out there, so it was really cool to see this. All those little specks down there are green turtles mm -hmm. nesting at Rain Island in the Northern Great Barrier Reef. It's the largest green turtle population in the world. What they were able to document is essentially for quite a long time now, it looks like that population is producing 100% females. So sea turtles have environmental sex determination, hot chicks, cool dudes. The hotter and drier it is, the more females are produced. And 
there were alarm bells raised here closer to home as well. So Dr. Weineken's work down at FAU, this is down in South Florida. The chart that you see there, it's not really easy to see, but those are nest numbers and hatchling numbers. There's lots of years where 100% of the sampled hatchlings were female. And so we're kind of concerned, you know, how many males are out there? We don't really have good answers for that. And how many do we need? So it's not only a function of how many do we need to keep all the eggs fertilized, but keep in mind genetic diversity is also important. So having enough males to maintain that genetic diversity. There's a lot we don't know. Again, this is where Georgia, we have a cool history. So uh, Jake LaSalle now leads Mo Green Lab's uh, sea turtle research program. While he was a master's student at Georgia Southern, he worked with Credit Research Project on Wausau for three years to sample a bunch of little hatchlings and then figure out who the dads were based on who mom is. What they found was 195 unique males contributed to the sampled nest over those three years. So there was an average of 2.6 males per set of eggs. And none of those were repeated across females or through time. So it led to a lot of questions. Does that mean there are a lot more males out there than we thought there are? Or do we have mating occurring along migratory corridors? So maybe the mating is not just right at the nesting beach, and maybe these males have mated with other females that are nesting in other places. And so the cool thing about our relatedness data is we can use these new females that are showing up to look backwards in time, you know, 25, 30, 35 years ago, and to try to say something about the males that were out there then. Now it's not apples to apples because we're not sampling hatchlings. We're sampling the females that have made it back. But it's still giving us a glimpse backwards in time. And so I just wanted to kind of close up here with a few families from the Georgia coast. This is a mom that last nested during the first year of the project on Ossabaugh. She's had three daughters come back so far and all three of those daughters had a different father. So. In this particular case, if we look at the pedigrees for these turtles, and notice they are all fairly close to, to mom there in this particular case. We have one that's primarily on Wausau, one that's on Ossabaw. This dad, 73, we didn't see him show up anywhere else in the data. But for the other two dads, they did actually have other daughters that have recruited in that, that last recruitment cohort. So if we look here at dad two, 1120, he also mated with some unknown females and produced daughters that entered the nesting population. If we look at where those daughters are nesting compared to that Ossabaugh daughter, we have one right next door on Wausau, but the other one is all the way up on Edisto Island in South Carolina. So that's 100 kilometers away. This dad 920 here also mated with what looks like three other females to produce three daughters. If we look at where they're nesting, we have one, you know, a little bit further south. We have one down on Cumberland. And again, we have one all the way up in the Grand Strand of South Carolina. So these daughters from the same dad are nesting over through almost 300 kilometers apart. So it's reinforcing the idea that Brian Bowen had originally that a lot of this mating is occurring probably along migratory corridors where a lot of these females are coming from the south and going north. A lot of these females are coming from the north and going south. The males that have been tracked leave where they are and they go set up shop and they wait on the girls to come by. <laughs> so it's an opportunity for a lot of genetic mixing. So that's, it's good news for genetic health. It's good news if we are producing more males than they are in South Florida, although that remains to be determined. It's really bad news for us for tracking the males because it, it reinforces the idea we can't just look on one beach and collect dead hatchlings or, or samples from live hatchlings. We really have to do the same thing we're doing with the females and try to look at a really big spatial scale to get an idea of how many males are out there. Do you have a question? Yeah. Okay. So finally, I wanted to wrap up with circling back to that relatedness data that I gave you all, the idea that we have you know, one in five of these turtles has a sister. I think some of that could go back to the incubation environment. It really may be that some of these females are putting these nests in really good spots. 
a lot of studies have looked at the health of the hatchlings. So it's not only that those hotter nests are producing more females, they're also smaller, they tend to crawl more slowly, they tend to have less swim thrust when they're swimming. Dr. Weineken has, has led the way with a lot of this hatchling sex work. The problem is you can't do, there's no way to take a sample right now and know whether a hatchling is male or female. Or at least historically that was the case. You had to either sacrifice the hatchling or you had to raise it in captivity until it was big enough that you could do laparoscopic work to identify the sex. So she's done that. She brings these turtles into captivity, keeps them until they're big enough that she knows whether they're boys or girls, and then they get released. What they found is not only do these females start out smaller, they grow more slowly. So there really does seem to be a lasting legacy with where those eggs are on the beach. So it could have a really tremendous impact on, at the population level, literally for decades to come. And then finally, I wanted to wrap up with a, a special female for me, uh, who the Georgia sea, Turtle, Georgia sea Turtle Center folks named Big Bertha. I didn't know her as Bertha. I just knew her as a turtle that I saw during my, my thesis work. Uh, anywhere, anytime I had downtime on other beaches, so I went down to Melbourne Beach, down to Juneau Beach, down to Cape Canaveral, up to Cape Romaine in South Carolina, I would hang out on the Georgia coast and try to pop out and get samples. And so Jekyll was a nice spot, you know, one of the few Georgia barrier islands I could drive to. And I met her in 2006, took a little skin sample, put her in our genetics database. She was tagged, but it looked like fairly recently until my better half, Brianna Honditch, dug through some of Bellman's records and realized that there were tags that went all the way back to 1980. So this turtle was tagged the year I was born. <laughs> and we were able to track her forward through time on Cumberland in 2016. So that means she nested for at least 36 years. Maybe more, but at least that long. Unfortunately, we haven't seen her since, so we think that was it for her. And this brings me to a final point, which is we don't have a way to age living turtles right now. Unfortunately, the best we can do is skeletal chronology which means that you take the humerus bone and you look for growth rings, just like we would look at rings of a tree. Um, I think that we really need to know how old these turtles are, and I'm hopeful now that there's been some progress made on this front with green turtles, that we will be able to age loggerheads sometime, hopefully within the next five years or so. And if you think about the data that, that we have here, knowing that we have moms at the end of their lives, knowing that we have these new daughters showing up, that gives us age of sexual maturity, that gives us reproductive longevity. These are really important parameters that we need for this life history model for loggerheads. So all these data that we've been collecting all these years have been used to build a population model that Georgia DNR and, and other agencies can use to ask questions, you know, what if questions about what, you know, what if the microplastics are causing X percentage of these, these juveniles to die. You can plug numbers in there and you can see what the population looks like 100 years from now or 300 years from now. So the more data we can collect to refine that model, the better we can arm all of the management agencies in terms of dealing with a lot of problems with very limited resources. So uh, that kind of brings us to crossroads that we're at with this project. We were really fortunate to have federal funding Species recovery grants to the states for 12 years. That ended in 2021. So we're sort of uh, trying out this, how do we move forward? What does it look like, period. I wanna send a huge thank you to the Sea Island Sea Turtle Program because they donated $50,000. That basically kept us alive as far as our Georgia portion of the project. But we still have a long way to go to even be able to run all the samples from 2023. And then just trying to figure out long term. Uh, we really would like to keep this project going. It may not look like it always did. We may not be sampling every single nest, but we would like to continue capturing as much data as we can from these, these females moving forward. And I think that gives us opportunities to roll in some of these other things I've talked about, to piggyback these things on the continued long term monitoring. So, this aging thing that I mentioned, it's not genetic, but it's epigenetic. So it's not the DNA sequences themselves, 
but it's these levers that are turning genes on and off that we can use to estimate age. I think one thing that we could transition to potentially instead of taking eggs is relying more on opportunistically sampled dead hatchlings at the end when we do inventories because that those are cheaper to process, they're faster to process. Now that we've laid the groundwork of all this, this tagging for so long with the eggs, we have a lot of mom's DNA. So it's easier for us to match hatchlings to, to those moms. And we get the added bonus of getting some information about the males at the same time. And then finally, just those, those hatchling fitness things that I discussed. All these things have been happening, but I would love to see all of them be integrated on the Georgia coast, you know, all happening in one population where we can really get the whole picture together. So I just, I want to thank everybody for being here. If, um, if you're not familiar with the Genetics Project, most of the volunteers are on Facebook, so we tend to post updates on our Facebook page. I've been really terrible about it this fall, busy teaching, but I'm going to try to get back to that now that winter's here and I can spend more time on that. The QR code there will take you to a landing page for my website. So if you want to navigate around and see some inf more information about these turtles and more information about some of the other projects that we have going, there's also information there if you do want to donate to the project. We have a UGA Foundation account. So it's completely tax deductible. Every penny will go to the project. There's no overhead or anything taken out. So there's instructions on there. If you want to cut a check or there's also a link directly to that UGA Foundation site if you want to just do it electronically. So I just want to thank you all again for being here. Thanks to everybody who's contributed to this project over many, many years. And if anybody has any ideas on how we can keep this stuff going in a more sustainable, long-term way, I mean, we'd be happy to have that discussion. Thank you. Talk about sea turtles, Georgia, Georgia sea turtles. Are we talking about loggerheads? What, what, can you give me an understanding of what species we're talking about? Is it multiple species? We're talking about in the nesting beach, it's mostly loggerheads. It's mostly loggerheads. Okay. So we occasionally get green turtle nests. Uh, we used to get leatherback nests, they kind of have, sh have shunned us lately. <laughs> um, every once in a while, we'll get a Kemp's Ridley. Um, Wausau has a Kemp's Ridley loggerhead hybrid that is nesting there. She's nested for three nesting seasons. In the water, we have a lot of juvenile green turtles and a lot of juvenile Kemp's Ridleys in addition to the loggerheads. So the loggerheads are the most common species. And those are the real big ones. Leatherbacks are the really, really big ones, but loggerheads are the, the big ones among the hard